Hello, hello, this is Alba Gomez and welcome to Amplify the Podcast. I am incredibly passionate about helping men and women amplify who they are and how they show up in the world. Let's have a conversation about how you can amplify your confidence and presence so you get the results you want in your business and career. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Amplify the Podcast. And we have today a very special guest, not other than the beautiful Dr. Kat. Catherine Isco is the co-founder and CEO of Advanced Human Man Imaging Limited, a dual-listed company on the Australian and American stock exchanges based in Perth. And I first met Catherine because we were together on the Pulse of Perth for Channel 9, and I started following her in social media, and I was captivated with for with her incredible passion and energy. And once I got to meet her, I absolutely find so fascinating and magnetic how she is so alive and full of passion, but she has such a, an interesting background that makes her very logical at the same time. So welcome, Kat, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Very excited. So let's get right into it. So I would like to ask you, Let's start with learning a little bit more about Kat. What is something not many people know about you? I'm very short. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, to be honest, when they meet me, they think I'm like 5'10", but I'm actually barely 5'1". I think I'm. F I think my partner actually just came back from a two-month trip, and the first thing he said to me was, I'm pretty sure you've shrunk. But I think even though I'm small in stature, I think I have a very big personality, which is good and maybe not so good in some ways. <laughs> it is so good. I do love it. And I do understand what you're saying too. <laughs> so in line with that, that you just share with us, what, was, what has been your biggest challenge in life? My brain. Mm. Uh, no, like, no question in regards to my brain, because I think once you can master that, and I don't think anyone can actually master their brain, but once you realize that if you focus on strengthening your mindset, life gets a heck of a lot easier. Now, this is not to say that the poop doesn't hit the fan around you. You're still, you know, kids are still going to be kids. Work is still going to be work. But a book by Viktor Frankl can be really summarized between the stimulus and response. There's a space. And if you can master that space before you respond, that's when you can start managing expectations and how you approach life and also the outcomes that you want from life. So that's why I truly believe that the brain is the most miraculous, but also the most underutilized organ that we have in the human body. Absolutely. And I so agree with that because I would say my biggest challenge is getting control of my brain and my mind. And I totally understand what you're saying. We just take mm -hmm. it one day at a time and see how much we can grow every day. That's it. That's it. And also understanding it's the small things that are going to make the big difference. If you look at the research, even in regards to meditation, you can't just meditate once and derive the benefits from it. It's, it's looking at consistency. So it's catching thoughts. So mindfulness is when you are reacting to something, you won't be able to look at your thoughts within that very highly emotional, intense moment. What people can start with is to look back at that moment and start to think, you know, I wonder what my thought processes were, uh, were at the time. How can I reapproach that when that situation happens again? And effectively, you're looking for patterns. Once you can pick up patterns in your life, that's when you can start putting in processes in place to strengthen your mindset. Absolutely. I love that. And do you meditate? Not formally, no. I meditate when I walk my dogs in my own special way. And I think that's really important to recognize that a lot of people, when I used to work with clients, they say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to set aside 15 minutes before I start the day. And I'm going to prepare a beautiful room in my house. And basically they're, they're hoping that their kids will leave them alone for that 15 minutes. And the husband is, are going to take, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Let's be honest here. And I was just say, if you're taking the train to work, take 15 seconds, not 15 minutes, 15 seconds, just to notice your thoughts start there, you know, you can't sprint before you walk. So when it comes to meditation, you do you boo, 
figure out how it works for you and how it works for me is to let my mind sort of wander, but also to be somewhat in control of it when I walk the dogs. And that's what works for me. Bada bing, bada boom. That's it. Exactly. And I always say that to my clients as well. Like I invite people to have a little more mindfulness and stop running in autopilot all day. And, and obviously we get this idea that we need to sit down in a certain position for 20 minutes and how are we going to fit that in busy lives? But I love that idea of being mindful in very little periods of time throughout the day is a great way of just really getting those benefits of being present in the moment, which at the end of the day is I think what meditation is all about. That's it. Okay, so what would you say, how kind is Kat to herself? One to 10, if one is being very mean and 10 is being really, really, really kind. I would say 99.9% kind. Awesome. I love it. And how did you get there? A lot of friggin' practice. <laughs> <laughs> now, I need to... I need to preface this by saying that I am kind to myself, but it doesn't mean that being kind to myself is easy. Uh -huh. So there's a big difference between the two. Practicing kindness is really, really hard. Prioritizing kindness for yourself should not be hard because it's a decision. And you look at the Latin roots of the word decision, decidere, which means to cut off. What I did in the past was not being kind to myself. I cut that off and I said, from this moment forward, I need to be kind to myself. Now that looks like many different things in many different situations in life. So for example, if I'm having an argument with someone, I need to recognize that, look at my thoughts, i.e. mindfulness and say, okay, are these thoughts useful to me? And am I protecting myself in regards to support my, for myself first? That's what kindness looks like. Kindness doesn't mean that when you're having a bad day, you drop everything. You're like, okay, I'm going to watch Netflix for the entire day and I'm going to bitch about the world and I'm going to scroll through and like, that's not kindness. Compassion is not self-pity. It's not complacency. It's not prioritizing yourself over every single human being on earth. That's impossible for mothers to do. Compassion and kindness just recognizes the fact that you are human. You are not perfect. And once you acknowledge that, that to me is what kindness is. It's not like warm baths and bubbles and online shopping, this and that. Like, let's be honest here. It's so much simpler than that. I know, but at the same time, so much harder. And, and one thing that I have found with myself, especially, and obviously I talk a lot about this topic is we get into this habit of being really hard on ourselves and the expectations we have of us. And we go through life from one extreme to another, either we overindulge and get the, the shopping, the massage, the laziness, and then we're going to beating ourselves up because we did it, because we couldn't just be there. And I love that word compassion. And I thought it's a really big part of the work you do is because I have learned that if I cannot be compassionate to myself, I cannot be compassionate to others. And I am going to struggle a lot to show up being the real me and to communicate with others. If I am not able to be neutral when I communicate with them from my compassionate place to be able to see and to feel compassion for where they are at. Absolutely, people will call your bullshit basically, I think is what you're saying. It's the same with confidence. You know, there's this thing, fake it till, you're, yeah, fake it till you make it. I don't believe in that statement because that effectively means that you have to trick your brain. Your brain is heck of a lot smarter than you think it is. You cannot, lie to your brain. The only time that you can potentially do this is if there's any kind of uh, neurological deficit, psychopathy, you know, even narcissism, etc. That potentially could be, I guess, the exception to the rule. But if you have a healthy brain, it doesn't work. And it's the same thing when it comes to if you if you don't practice what you preach, people will see through that point. Absolutely. Blank. Absolutely. I actually like a lot the fake it until you make it from the perspective of don't wait until you're 100% confident to do things. But I definitely understand what you're saying. Yeah. I see it as two yeah. different things. So what is the most, the least confident area? Which is the area in your life or business career, all of the areas that make you a human being that you feel you are the least confident? I, this may be, it might seem like an egotistical answer. So I'll explain it. I don't have 
at this moment in time any aspects of my life that I'm not confident in. And I'll tell you why. Confidence in my definition is turning thoughts into action. Mm -hmm. If you look down at that, for example, let's say you were asked to give a talk on astrophysics. I mean, I do not know anything about this. So the question would, would I be, am I not confident to give that talk? The answer is no, because I know everything is figure outable, right? Now, would I do a great job in giving that talk? No, definitely not. But it doesn't break my confidence. Confidence to me is saying yes, because everything is figure outable. So that's why I don't believe that I suffer any longer from confidence because I know time is ticking. Time is ticking very quickly. And that's why I'm saying hell yes to every opportunity because I know I'm going to figure it out. And secondly to that is I think in the first half of my life, I didn't realize that the people who are around me and want to support me by accepting their help doesn't mean that I'm weak. It actually means that I'm effing strong. I'll give you an example. I'm currently in this being elected as CEO for uh, the company I co-founded with my partner. I said, yes, I do. And I've said to the board, I've said, you know, there are some things that I don't know, but I know that I have an amazing team that's wrapped around me. And I also have an amazing partner that has been doing this for the past, well, seemingly 300 years. So everything is figure outable. So say yes. That is incredible. And I admire so much that quality. And I think that's something we all want and something that I 100% believe in my heart and that I would like to really, if we could, between the two of us, just really share that at a deeper level to inspire, especially I think men and women can struggle with it. But I think women, most more likely, we tend to be so hard on ourselves and we, we tend to wait until we think we know it all to put our hand up, either for the promotion, for the project, for the opportunity. So what would you say to somebody who knows she hasn't got a workout already that she can say yes today because she will be able to work it out? Just to have that self-belief to say, yes, I will work it out. So it starts with compassion. So there's a direct link between self-compassion and motivation with mental health. So people who treat low self-worth, low confidence with stoicism, which essentially means I'm just going to dismiss any feelings I have, and I'm just going to keep my chin up and sort of push through it. That is going to, the only thing that's going to do is help you fail very, very quickly. Treating yourself with compassion means that, hey, you know what, I might not be the best at it, but I have a secure secure foundation of self-worth. The way I describe self-worth is kind of like a big fat Buddha that's in your brain. And this Buddha kind of says, hey, go and try something. So you go and try something, you know, you're in a board meeting, you put up your hand and then everyone's like, oh, give you that face. Like, you know, that face that indicates what kind of question was that? Your Buddha after that meeting says, come on over here. You know, I got to admit that wasn't the greatest question, but I just want to remind you that you're still an awesome human being, even though that wasn't the best question. So having that secure base of self-worth is gonna allow you to say yes to those opportunities, but also provide you a little bit of a wiggle room to allow you to fail, to allow you to make errors. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds because it does support that brain function that especially women have, that unless you have 100% of the qualities, don't go forth. It's kind of like that wiggle room that says, go forth and prosper, but when you fail, because you probably won't do everything right, know that you still are an amazing human being. And again, research, especially by Dr. Kristen Neff, who's a leader in self-compassion, has showed that people who practice self-compassion and self-kindness, even when they do fail, they will reset goals and try again. So when we're talking about leadership, when we're talking about women not only putting their hand up, but keeping their hand up, Self-compassion is like a magic pill. The problem is, is that we look at self-compassion as self-pity, complacency, and I'm here to say that is, it's just wrong. So no, don't spread that. 
it's bullshit data. Self-compassion is a way to motivate us to do more amazing things, step into roles of leadership, and also just be better humans in general, you know, with our relationships, being mums, uh, being caregivers. So, I mean, I can't speak about self-compassion any, any more highly. I know. And it's kind of like something that I, I always think about when I speak about this and what you were saying is knowing that you can put your hand up and do the project or say yes, but you can get it wrong. And that is right. That is all right. Mm -hmm. And I actually, mm -hmm. on that note, I had a conversation with this leader. He's a very young a male leader in a very massive company whose team is all middle-aged men. And one of the things he was saying when he talked to me is like, I really need I want out of this session because I'm doing a presentation for them. I want you to remind these intelligent, capable guys that they don't have to be scared of getting it wrong. <laughs> and it's kind of like we I know we as women think that men have that confidence that even if they get it wrong, they say, ah, I'll do it. But they also feel it the same way. And I think it's a human feeling that we just want to get it right. We want to do our best when we get it wrong is stopping ourselves for doing things for the fear of not getting it wrong. And I think at some point we mistakenly thought that being perfect was the goal. Absolutely, you know, it's a bit of a social status thing, right? You know, whether we admit it or not, we equate failure, i.e. not doing, you know, 100% on that project. We immediately jump to conclusions and say, oh, we've not done great. Our boss is gonna call us into the office. They're going to say, if you don't buckle up, you're going to lose your job. And then we start catastrophe. Oh my God, if we lose our job, how are we going to pay for the mortgage? Then our partner is going to leave us. Then our kids are going to have to go to therapy for the rest of their life because I'm such a crap caregiver. And like, we have this whole thing that plays out in our mind and nothing friggin has happened. And whether you are a woman, a man, an alien or anything in between, you know, no one can escape that. You know, we all want to be seen as intelligent, productive, and amazing human beings that other people respect and love. You know, once we really admit that, and we admit that that's at the core of it, that really, when we fail, we're not scared of failure, we're scared of being ashamed, and we're scared of other people looking at us as lower human beings, not worthy of love and be belonging. And that's really it. And once people recognize that they're not scared of failure, they're scared of feeling ashamed and not being worthy of love and belonging, man, the switch that goes off in your brain is incredible because you can't fix what you don't admit. Point Absolutely. blank. Absolutely. That's incredible. And I was actually reading... I'm reading a book at the moment that is called Coming Alive. And it's these two psychology psychiatrists, I think psychiatrists, and they were talking about the fear in human beings and how ultimately when we feel fear, the ultimate fear we're feeling is the fear of dead. Even if it's, let's say, if I ask you to show up live now on TV, we get so freaked out. But at the end of the day, our brain just goes into the most catastrophic idea of dying. When you go back and think, how are we going live on TV and making a mistake? connects with dying is kind of silly. It's kind of like we really just run in stories of the worst scenarios. And as things and the things we fear always say, it's just the, the fear that never happens. So it's kind of like, really, I love that. Just really coming back to the present moment of, okay, what if I just take these little mm -hmm. risks and what happened? See what happened. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. So in that, in that opposite now direction, what is the one thing that gives you the most joy in life? Oh, the people around me, my partner, I say my partner only because I can screw up as much as I need to, and he will always just be there. And basically, he's kind of like my Buddha, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, you kind of screwed that one up, but what are you going to do differently moving forward? And so I think without him, even though we are polar opposites in so many ways, you know, he's the yin to my yang in that sense. And obviously my dad, who I have an inexplicable relationship with, he's like my twin, mm -hmm. if you will. So I guess two men in my life that really helped me be, enabled me to become and be the person that I believe I can be. 
which sounds God, that sounds so American. Be all you can be, but, <laughs> you know, self self actualize, but self actualize as myself, not who people expect me to be. If that makes sense, that is. And so I think good. I waste a lot. Yeah, I think I waste a lot of years saying, okay, for me to be successful, I need to look like this. I have to have this many degrees. I have to have this in place. I have to have that car. And now I just realize, like the that's not success because who dictates what success is you can be the only person who does that so yeah i think they've really helped me basically just tell me you do you boo and we'll be there to back you up how beautiful is that when i have a husband like that who allows me just to be me and and love me for who i am and give it, it allows you to kind of it's kind of like that permission who you are is good enough who you are is brilliant and is beautiful so what is success for cat then Oof, that's a good question. Success for me is being there for people who need me to be there. I think that's really important to me. That's uh, part of my value is kindness, first to myself, but also to others. I wrote a mission statement a few months ago, and it, I paraphrase, but it's something along the lines of to positively impact anyone I meet from the postman to another CEO, to a president, to a movie star, it doesn't, doesn't matter who I meet. An example of this is I, I know my postman from his first name. I have his mobile number in my phone. And I remember being at a coffee shop and he walked by and I said, oh, hi, Rob, how you doing? And the people that I was with, is, they're like, you know your postman's name? I'm like, of course I do. I see him like three times a week. Of course, I know exactly who he is. So effectively to summarize is that to me is success is to leave this world and ensure that I've done my best to leave it in a more positive place when it comes to people. I love that. And I, as I said, that one of the things that I love the most about you is that energy and that kindness that you exude wherever you go. So it is so mm -hmm. beautiful when a person has come to a place, I think personally, that they define the success mm -hmm. like they have in, in this world. And I think there's no more beautiful way of living for you and for the people that yes. you are surrounded by. So I absolutely love that. Love it, love it, love it. So yeah, I, I will admit though that Yes. So I was going to say, I will admit that I, I just want to be transparent and say I do have an ego mm -hmm. um, just because I don't want to put myself on this like a whole, uh, you know, the ethereal kind of platform, which I'm definitely not. I'm fallible, just like everyone else. Like there is an ego. I, I want to succeed. I want to lead. I want to be financially successful and financially free. And the reason why I'm going to say that is I, I presume you have a lot of women listeners. And I want to say that you, you don't have to apologize for wanting to be that. You don't want to, you don't need to apologize for wanting to be on the front cover of a magazine. You don't want to apologize for buying a very expensive pair of shoes, which I had been known to do several times. Like, don't apologize for that. Don't apologize for what makes, what, what defines your success. And to me, inherently in that, that success. An example of this is if I need to go home and take a nap during the day, I don't apologize for that, that success. Um, so I think it's so important, this question, especially for women, define success for what it means to you, not what you think others believe success looks like for you. Absolutely. And I literally have this conversation every day with my clients. And one of the first thing I do with them is let's define success for you, but let's forget society. Mm -hmm your family, your upbringing, the group of friends you have. And, and it's quite, I think it is quite, it sounds such a simple question, but it has so much depth. When you're allowed to go into your heart and be honest with yourself to define what is success to you, what will give you happiness. And I think when we live from that place, there's so much freedom, there's so much richness, and there's so much success that breeds from that place because you are able then to define what it is to live your life in your terms. And I love the other side of what you mentioned as well. It's like, you can be kind, you can be compassionate, loving, have a beautiful energy of wanting to give, but you do you and go as big as you want with expensive, beautiful high heels, the full of makeup or none of it. Who said what mm -hmm. is right, what is not? And, and I think for us women, especially, 
and it, it's like we kind of in Australia and you know we don't have that and in Colombia definitely we don't have that but that difference of you don't want to stand out that that tall poppy syndrome thing like you just want to keep it small and I'm here like on a mission saying no go big go bigger as big as you can because that is what is going to create a meaningful life you are not making anybody feel less by doing that if something they will get inspired and if they get triggered is their business not yours Agreed. Be a peacock. Exactly. So I always say to Australians, let me bring you some Colombian peacockness and then just really yeah. go big, your version of big, obviously. But it's so much more fun to live when we are not second guessing and questioning if we were fitting in a little tiny box all the time and thinking that what people think of you defines your life. I think that's a very sad and hard way of living life and the easiest way to get depressed and get miserable. Agreed. Uh, absolutely agreed. So just uh, just on a side topic, I was thinking, are you planning on seeing your family anytime soon? Because I guess you will be dying to be able to reunite with them. Would love to, would absolutely love to. I don't think that's going to happen at least for another year, unfortunately. Also, just because obviously this new position is, is not a five days a week job. Yes. It's a seven days a week job. And I, I I do feel that I'm at the point of my life that I know that my life's most important work now begins. This is much different than a private company. This is a public company that has shareholders and I want to show them that my full focus is towards the success of this company. And I think I've made that very clear with my family that I cannot have any distractions. I want this to be my 100% focus, not 99.9% focus. And until I do that, because I'm very stubborn, and until I achieve success with this company, unfortunately, nothing is going to get in my way. Excellent. I love it. And, and as soon as you know, they know where you're at and they will be supporting you for sure. I'm just literally counting yes. the days until I go back and see my family. So I was just thinking how exciting when we finally get reunited with all of them. Now we're free in Australia, sort of. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm thinking, what, what do you think is the correlation between self-awareness and confidence? A direct correlation. So uh, like I would say like an R value of one. So that, that simply means that there is an irretractable relationship between self-awareness and confidence. The reason why I say that is because as per my uh, initial statement, you can't, I don't believe that you can fake it until you make it, until you're truly self-aware, meaning that you understand your blind spots when it comes to thoughts, feelings, beliefs, which obviously preclude action until you're fully self-aware of those things. I don't believe that confidence is actually confidence. I, I believe it's just, I don't want to say flippant by any means, but let me take a step back. Confidence to me is not doing things perfectly. It's turning thoughts into actions. It's also understanding that what you do is not necessarily going to work out. Now, I'm not talking about risk taking here. I'm not talking about, you know, jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. Confidence to me is saying, regardless of what happens, it's okay. I know you're a good person. And if and when that happens, when the shit hits the fan, let's regroup and let's try again. You can only do that if you understand this. And that's why self-awareness is so important. If you look at many of the leaders, they talk about self-awareness as the foundation to their personal growth. And obviously through this personal growth becomes a professional growth. One of the leaders that I follow is Jeff Weiner, Weiner. I'm never sure how to say it. He was a former CEO of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I've listened to many of his interviews and uh, I, I truncate here. He said, without self-awareness, he was never going to be the compassionate leader that he was. And recognizing that it was through the self-awareness that he was able to drive LinkedIn's acquisition by Microsoft for, I believe it was $26.2 billion. That's billion with a B, not an M, just for, <laughs> for absolute clarity there. So we know that self-awareness is not just important for one's personal growth, but effectively, as you and I work with a lot of leaders, it's needed for your professional growth and for the growth of companies. And that's why I believe investing in a company's personnel 
when it comes to self-awareness, I don't think is no longer seen as, oh, that's home stuff. Mm -hmm. We deal with that at home. Forward thinking companies understand that when you invest in your team's personal growth, it has a direct relationship to confidence, i.e. self-awareness, confidence, and therefore confidence in regards to the growth of the company. Uh, Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. And so I, what I could be, go on and on yes, and on. Yes, I know. That, both, but I'll truncate it there. Yeah, both of us are very passionate about that topic. So, what would would be your top tips for a person who's listening who wants to develop their self awareness and confidence? What do you think is the most important place to start with? Well, you're not going to. Uh, a lot of people won't like this answer. I'll, I'll tell you that because I didn't like the answer. You need to start listening to the feedback from people you trust. That's really hard because basically what it feels like is the equivalent of a slap in the face after an acid peel like <laughs> that shit hurts it hurts um I'll, I'll give you an example and this is many many years ago uh when i was single and i was basically like a monkey swing through branches like from relationship to relationship because i was relying on their validation to explain if if or not i was a good person so relationship and i would just basically be the stage five clinger. I would do anything they say, I would change myself and the relationships would always drop off. Speaking to a buddy of mine and he effectively said, you do realize that you're the common denominator, right? <laughs> and it was like that slap in the face, but I can tell you now without a shadow of a doubt, he was absolutely right. And so until you get these slaps in the face, you're never, ever, ever going to be self-aware because you're just bullshitting yourself. You're not dealing with the inherent problem. My inherent problem is I was so desperate for people to like me that I didn't care whether they respected me or not. And that is so hard to change. And that's something that I put up my hand on my heart saying that I'm still working on and I know I'm gonna to have to work on that for the rest of my life. And that's why I work with a psychologist. I work with a coach, like just because I'm at this stage doesn't mean that I'm any more like any less human than anyone else. But I think getting that feedback and also understanding that receiving feedback requires you to keep your mouth shut and your ears open. It is not an opportunity for you to defend yourself. It is not an opportunity to instigate an argument. If it's coming from a person you trust, keep your mouth shut. Now, is this hard? Absolutely. Especially if you've had a couple of glasses of wine, almost impossible to do. So pick your battles, pick your battles, pick the timing. Uh, and also strike while the iron is cold. Don't do it when you're in a heated emotional state. Absolutely. Mm. I love it. I I couldn't agree more. And part of the work I do when I'm helping somebody develop their personal brand is let's, let's get to see how people perceive you. And I give them a specific questionnaire to give to close people to them to get honest feedback. And everybody gets so blown away with a lot of positive stuff. But understanding those blind spots, I to me, is the key for you to really be in go to that next level because when we understand how people see us, see us and the, the the great richness that is in those perceptions that bring so much truth to things that you probably might know but you're trying to pretend they're not happening if you choose to change that you're on the road to your success that's it fully agree <laughs> anything else in regards to self-awareness and confidence that you will do after getting uh, that feedback time oh my god time Geez, Louise, can I tell you that the, the number of times that I've heard and also based from my own experience that uh, you expect to change overnight, uh, don't expect to change in regards to, you know, let's say someone says you never you never fully listen to people and you always think that your opinion is right, not wrong. I know I'm stubborn in that in that regard. So I've had to practice and practice and practice to pause, stop, pause, allow this information to come in, not react to it, give myself time and space. That is, you're not gonna nail it every single time. You know, remind yourself that you're human. Uh, and again, if you look at Dr. Kristen's network, 
one one of her core things when it comes to self worth and self compassion is a, a term called common humanity, and effectively that what that means is that you are not the only one who's going through this. And I think that's really really important. Oftentimes when you get feedback, you think, oh my god, you equate it to the fact that you've killed a nun. <laughs> like that's how it feels you feel like i'm never going to be able to fix this i'm a bad person and let me tell you if you think you're a bad person you're never going to be able to change right so it's like all this spiral coming through so reminding yourself that ouch that hurt that feedback really hurt don't call a spade a spade you know someone telling you that you know you're you're a crap communicator that's not that's not a reason to have a party like, let's not try to sugarcoat things. That sucks. That's that's hard. You know, name the emotion, hurt, ang um, angry, disappointed, w feeling isolated, feeling like everyone's uh, like looking at you in a negative, call that stuff out, but then also recognize that you're not the only bad communicator in the world, world honey. Like, let's just be, let's be realistic here. And then you can really pr progress from there, but that takes time. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Kat, for being with us here today. I absolutely love your insight. A huge, massive congratulations on your new undertaking. I, I really know it will be an inspiration to so many other women, young, intelligent, capable women to be inspired to go to that level that we all know is available if we start putting our hand up, if we start just stepping yes. forward with confidence. So thank you again for being here. And I wish you absolutely all the most incredible best. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Amplify. If you have enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe. Also, I will love it if you leave us a review. See you for the next episode. Bye-bye.